Ah, there's a red light on. It's recording. We're here. Okay. Thank you. How'd you get that to work? PC. PC. Ah, so what is auxiliary video? Well, whatever. We're here. It's uh, massage therapy, anatomy and physiology, back muscles. It's Thursday, the 4th of June, 2015. So let's begin. <coughs> so what do I do? I have to stand behind here and point to the, yeah, get to know this. <coughs> so we're talking, when we're talking about muscles, folks, please. Okay. Phones, including mine, on stun, right? And it is, good. We're talking about muscles. Generally, we are concerned with, well, what do we need to know for the... Mbex, or what should we know anyway as therapists? Where they're located. Where they're located, okay. How they move. What, how they move, what, the, what, what they're moving, what levers or bones, joints they're crossing and moving. What else? Origin. Origin, insertion, insertion right? Mm -hmm. And how they move, what they're moving would be their action. Right? What action? Yeah. Well, the function, what's their function? What am I doing? Or what could I do without them? I'd be a bundle of sticks. Right? So, <coughs> and to a certain extent, of course, we also know, need to know whether or not we can palpate them. Right? Yeah. And what we're palpating, how deep they are. What else? What, is palpa like, what does palpating really mean? What does palpating really mean? That's what I thought. But touching. Touching. Okay. Well, it's touching, but it's, right? But it's, but but it's, it's feeling what's going on when you're touching. Is it hot? So that's Is it cool, right? What do you feel? Is it? Can you tell me. What do you feel when you work with? With sorry. Well, I was just kind of filling in the blank with what you're doing. I was mm -hmm. like, "Is there knots?" Knots, right? Okay. <laughs> I, adhesions. Adhesions, right? Scar tissue, right? Uh, imbalances. You're, you use your eyes to, to, well, you're palpating with your hands, but um, energetic blockages from a from an Eastern perspective, that's what's going on in there, right? And a an energy practitioner, and to a certain extent, I think almost all massage therapists have the ability to, and probably do, even if they don't know it, practice some sort of energy work. Um, we can break up those knots, those adhesions, those energy blockages. We can redirect energy. We can drain. We can put in. Depends on what needs to be done. But first, we have to know what the muscles are. So here we're looking at the what? What's the big one? The big tri. Let me. Oops, gotta get used to this. Uh, this big triangular muscle there. The trapezius, right? Which is the most superficial muscle in the back muscles. Okay, so this is definitely one you need to know. What is the origin or origins? Let's see, can I move this down? Take this down a little bit. Okay, right there, what are we looking at? All right, the external occipital protuberance. Remember what that is? That's a, that is an origin. And remember the ligamentum, right? The ligaments here, the ligamentum nuke. When you, when you talk about the occipital, is it just the occipital or the occipitals? Because I feel like technically there's like there's two. What is that? Well, stupid of me to say that? the protuberance. Well, there's one occipital bone, right? Yeah. Cranial bone. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has a protuberance. Can you see the? Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Protuberance in the middle. Okay. Now it also, even, pretty much even with the ear, right? Maybe the protuberance may be a little bit higher That's above the... G20? The, sorry? G20 is right there. GB, the tw GB20 is either side of the occipital protuberance because you've got two. Most meridians run in pairs, except for the two extraordinary meridians, the governing vessel and the conception vessel, which we'll get to another so now. the occipital muscle, is it considered two or is it one... I mean, the trapezius, it's, it's all one piece, but it's, it's bilateral. It's working on both sides of the body. Okay. 
It also originates from C7. One, let's see, one, two, three, four. It has two origins? It's got an, it, it's, okay, I want to go up here, but it's there. Okay, it's the origin, the origination is also, I mean, it runs from the, ox, the external occipital protuberance, it has attachments, right? The ligamentum nuke, which is all along here, and then the um, C7 through T12, all the way down, bing, right? All the way to T12. If you've got a trail guide, look at the trail guide as well. Use, use the trail guide. Don't just use what's up there, okay? Uh, or use whatever. I, I, I guess I have a trail guide here. I'm tired of lugging the heavy trail guide around, so I brought in the lighter book. And not every book will give you the exact same origins and insertions. Okay, so... The origin is at the occipital? The external, right? It's not in external. occipital protuberance, that bump in the middle. The ligamentum nuke, which is runs underneath, boom, down. Sorry. Who's is this? And the um, and the spinous processes. The insertion is T twelve. You said. No, no, no. We they're still originating from C seven through T twelve. It's a there are origins of. The muscle is so large, it really has three parts to it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, so do we have to know the insertion of the, the top uh -huh. and the pointy ends yep. and then the bottom? Yep. Everything? Yep. It's, oh, okay. it's an important, it's the most superficial muscle in the back. Yeah. Right? And uh, it's the one that you're going to be working on probably more than any, any, any other, yes. I would think. Right? Did you see? Yeah. So what do we do? We carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. The trapezius, feel it, you know, we're working on them all the time, right? You would agree? I definitely yeah. Yeah. I worked on some pretty tight ones. Yeah. I know you <laughs> I know the feeling. <coughs> okay, so, and, um, well, in some cases, it's a number of places because it's right. originating. Well, because the shape is the muscle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like that. Like it's not like a bicep, exactly. Right, exactly. It's got a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. What page is that on in the, um, in the trail guide? Hang on. 188. Thank you. We've got a couple extra copies up here if anybody needs. Right? Yeah, I do. And always. No, I'm not working from this book, so it might disagree with some of the things I say, but who else? Well, you could share copies, right? I mean, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind at all, but yeah. if there's one at both places, you can share it. Otherwise, whatever you want to do. So this is visible enough? Does that help? Yeah, it does. Okay. So the rhomboids sit right underneath, right? Rhomboids are right underneath, and we'll get, we'll get to them. They're Christmas tree muscles. Yeah. Mate, hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get, see, I want to be able to... I, but I want to be they're able to do. Yeah, they're. The trapezius is superficial. Correct. Yep. Let's see. Here, the, here's your rhomboid, and what I want to be able to do is to see. Isn't the rhomboid that little tiny piece right in there going down right there? Looks like it like right this. There, right going there. down. What I'm on now? Yeah. Or this? It's not that. It's here. It's underneath. You don't see it. Right. What I. I need to learn this human anatomy, whatever it's called, to be able to show you it attached to the bones, and because this doesn't tell me much of anything. Well, you got your rear delts are up there. Yeah, the delts are easy. Okay, so let's see what we can identify. The deltoid, deltoid. right? Yeah, but you okay. have rear delts, right? Yes. Yeah, you got your posterior, your middle. We don't see. We could turn this around and see, but. Uh, oh, that's cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. We. This part I like. Whoops. Okay. So, Whoa. And I, I don't know if we can, yeah, I guess we can make it smaller and we'd see more of what's going on. And here we could see the sternum and so on and so forth. <laughs> okay, but we're on, whoops, we're on the back. So let's turn them around. Whoops. 
Sorry, <laughs> that was very rude. You just wound us. <laughs> oh my. Let's okay, see. That weird. Oops, if we go down. That, that yeah. I want to be able to isolate the muscles and show you their movements, and I'm not. Huh? Can you click on it? I don't know. Yeah, right. Why don't I think of that? Well, okay. So there, that does show you, yes. Okay. Okay. So here's your external occipital protuberance, ligamentum nuke, and then it's also connecting from. Uh, what did we say? C7 all the way down to T12 on the spinous process. We understand what the spinous process is, right? right? The middle bumps all the way down the spine, right? In the beginning, you feel the large one at the junction of the... The process is the little bumpy things. Right, the process. But there's, 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 well, there's, we, on the spine, we've got spinal process, and we also have the ones on the side, the processes, which are called, anybody? Because, hmm? It's also a spinous process, but it's a transverse. transverse process. I don't mind if you look in the book. You know, I mean, when it comes to the test, obviously you can't do that. But not unless I give you a take home, which would be fine. With, well, you know, whatever works. Okay, practice exams. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm just wondering where they're looking to get that in the first place. Where they're looking. Oh, oh yeah, get to the actual page on the trapezius. Just has the full right. See, here I sometimes I use something like this. I can color it in, which you can see I haven't done. <coughs> but, but this, yeah, and I would think the trail guide as well gives you the details. C7 <coughs> through T12, which, of course, is all the way down the last thoracic vertebrae, right? Um, Spinous process. Okay. Um, the, the the upper the insertions are you've got the upper. I'm not used to this. The upper ins part of it inserts onto the lateral third of the clavicle. We could turn this guy around. Oh, here, look at that. Come on, there you go. Program that you're using or a website. No, it's a program. Yeah, it's a program. It's not a website. That we subscribe to, I believe. Okay, so you could see there, right? Okay. All right. Um, the acromion, right? A.K.A. the acromion process, which is where, what, what uh, articulates? Yeah, we don't know. The clavicle. Right. See, so it's the articulation between the clavicle, the lateral clavicle, and the scapula, yes. right? Oh, okay, sorry. Right? There, I don't know if it'll tell us yet. Okay, there it is. Well, we should have a skeleton in here. I really, I'm going to do what I can to get a full size. No, put together. Yeah, right, so we have to get it up here because it just makes a lot of sense to come up here and say, put your hands on it. Yeah, it may not look like the real thing, but it looks close enough, right? So I'll try and I'll make a note of that. Okay, let's see. What else? Where else are we inserting? So that's the, the so that's the top third, right? Of it. Right? Now the middle inserts on the scapula. Right? Right there on the spine of the scapula. There's well, that's not the scapula, but it's, we'll get to that. Okay, and then the lower, you say you insert, the the yeah, on the spine of the scapula, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Right there. Right there. Right, 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 whoops. Now the lower inserts on the root of the spine of the scapula, so it's a little bit lower. Right, so this is the lower section, right? So it doesn't touch the very bottom of the scapula. It just no, it's, it's, right. Field. Right, what I'd love to be able to do is call up a picture of a scapula and identify that with, what you know, insert, to isolate it. Insertion? Insertion isn't it where it's attaching. Okay. In other words, so it, what does it do by, what, what are the actions? 
There are, actually, there are three. It's got three parts. So there are, guess what? Three different actions, right? Okay, so the upper, what does it do? Shrug your shoulders. It's right. elevates. It elevates. What else is an upper going to do? It's lifting. Right? It elevates. <coughs> um, mm-hmm. Upward rotation of this That's all it does is elevate. It elevates. It also well, upwardly rotates. So upward right? Trap. On this part. And it depresses. And it depresses as well. It goes up and goes down. It depresses, elevates. Well, the, the, upper, the lower depresses. So there are three, so three, no three, three sections of it, right? Yeah. So they're actually antagonistic, right? The scapula works with and against oh, itself. Cool. Well, it's, Sorry. The, the middle section, which we said is inserting on the um, spine of the scapula, we could um, pose it back. What is that called, that action? Retraction. Retraction of the scapula. Okay. And the lower it brings it back down, depresses. Upper elevates, lower depresses. Okay, I'm not depressed. It's just my just my scapula. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. What I think of these things. Um, it also upwardly rotates the scapula. I'm not sure how well the two work together. The upper section and the lower section work together in terms of upward ro upward rotation. Um, <clears throat> You can definitely palpate this, there's no question about it. It's what we palpate. As Rebecca was saying more, she spent the whole, most of today working on trapezia. Yeah, somebody's trapezius. Somebody's trapezius. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. So if, some, so if there's a part of that, like just that particular muscle, like let's say like, a huge upper, broad muscle that's covering so much. Yeah. So let's say like the upper chest or actually <coughs> super tight, have mm -hmm. a bunch of trigger. Does that mean you work to get everything going? Would you work on the whole muscle itself? Well, you work on it probably in parts, but yes. Yeah, you're going to work. Would it be more beneficial to work on it as a whole? As a whole? So kind of like... It really depends. You have to work on it as a whole for the fibers to relax. Yeah. Well, they're doing different things, so... Remember, everything is connected, so to a certain extent, yes, you need to work on the whole thing, because if you... So you, if they're all messed up in here... Yeah, they're tight they here. Up here, and... Mm -hmm. I mean, you obviously work on the area to get it physically taken and, care of, but... And you'll feel it loosening up. You work in the neighborhood, right? Welcome to the neighborhood, because you got the rhomboids underneath it. You're going to... Yeah. Okay. So that's our trapezius, right? I don't know. Oh, what's it? oh, they could tell us about, yeah, that's the big, the lats. Let me just see what else I could have realized they could tell us about. Ah, they give us all the information right there. Look at that. Now we're talking. That's the origin. That's the origin. That's, that's good information. Yeah, right. This is I now I'm now I'm finding my way around. Oh, yeah. Ah, what happened? I think you just actually turned off my Yeah. I touched it. I'm carrying. I got all this electricity in me. <laughs> Energy. No, really. I mean, I, there are times I walk around my house and I short things out, especially after I've worked on somebody. <laughs> it is. Okay, you get used to it. I, power surges, really. Really. Okay, enough said. All right, so do I need to review any of this? Action, rotation, it doesn't tell us exactly what. Retraction, elevation, depression. That's a very involved muscle. It is. It's, it's but it doesn't pronate. No, it's, it's going to retract. to retract, right? Pronate, you need something forward, right? You need something. Right, you're using your anterior to pronate. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's see where we can go next. That's fine. All right. That's our other trap. Uh, delt. All right. You want you want to do the deltoid? We can. Whoa. So, can we lower this? Uh, 
Well, I was focusing, all right, we'll do the deltoid since we, we can't see it though. How can I do that? All right. We'll call this back. Nope. Hey. Oh. Nope. Ah, no, come back. All right, well, we were talking about, <coughs> I, don't, I don't want a disease, I want a definition there. Yeah, but this is attaching, yeah, I want to stay with the, with the back and the trunk muscles, so back up, come around. Those are pecs, aren't they? Yep, yep, that's pec major. But that's it, see, that's attaching to the humerus, that's not. Yes. <coughs> Serratus anterior, oh my goodness. Here you're going to upwardly rotate the scapula, but I don't want to go there yet. Okay. Ah. Yay, all right, now we've got both. How did I get both together? The scapula as well as the trapezius. Now we can see how it. No, we removed the delta. I have no idea how we did this, but this is great. How did the recording this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> They're hearing me say, I'm learning on the job. Well, this is what, it, what it's about. I'm going to get this system at home and next time. Anyway, all right, so we can see how the, the, right? Now you can see the attachments to the scapula of the, of the, to the trapezius. Of the Sorry? Right? The border of the yeah. Right, the medial, well, it's, it's, it's the, the it's not the whole thing, though. No, again, they, they say the occipital bone, okay, we, they, don't, they, say, they don't say protuberance, but anyhow, you can see it there on the occiput, uh -huh. okay. Um, the ligamentum nucae, right, okay, all along in here, and the spinous processes of they don't say C7. It's going to vary from book to book. They say T1 through T12, right? Um, and the insertion, we know lateral third of the clavicle, the acromion, and the, scap the spine of the scapula, of the scapula. That makes it a little easier. Lateral third and the whole spine, okay? <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a number of muscles that you need to know that stuff for. Okay, and the trapezius, I know, is a big one. Um, so the idea there is that it's a, uh, it's a triangular... It's a triangular muscle, and it's a... It's a and the spine follows the origin, and the arm, shoulder of the arm follows the insertion. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's inserting on the scapula and the clavicle, right? And it goes, so it goes from medial to lateral. That's right. That's right. And the and the fibers, you can see how the fibers run here. The upper third, the fibers are running on a kind of a diagonal down, right? The middle third are running more in a horizontal manner, and the lower third are pinating are up. You see the difference? So depending on what they're or where they're located will give you a sense of what they, and where they're inserted, and what they're going to be doing. Okay, right hand. It's But if you're going to palpate it, you're going to follow the fibers, you know to go... That's exactly right. Up if you from the bottom. Mm -hmm down from the top and over. And over in the center. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if somebody's dealing with, with headache issues, what's tightening up? Right? You're going to be working right in there and then on the upper third of the scapula. Right? Get that to relax. Blood supply returns to the, to the head, to the brain. Headache goes away. And there are other ways to do that as well, but that's certainly it's likely, if you've got a vascular headache, that the muscles are constricting the blood vessels. <coughs> okay, what else can we see? Let's see. <coughs> Go, oops. Uh, no, I don't, don't want that. Huh? Let's see. Uh, 
ah, there we go, the erector spinae. Can we get closer there? I want to see it all. No, 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 come on. Yeah, I want to get rid of the, oh, maybe I would need to get into a lower. Oh, there's volume. Trapezius. Hey, I don't have to say a word. Uh, that's all it's going to tell. How many do you want next? The erector spinase? Yeah. Or the multiple? Yeah, well, okay. that's the longissimus, which is part of the erector spinae. Nope. I think we have to go deeper. Nope, no, no, back, back. See if we can go deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, sir, I have a question. Yeah, sure. For this class this evening, we're going over the muscle, correct? Yep. Okay, I'm just trying to catch up because I'm a little lost. Are we only going over the muscles that are in the trunk area? Or right now, yeah. We're, we can only do so much at a time, right? Okay. She told us to learn chapter four. So what is chapter four? In, in, that's what she said to me. In the trail guide or in the textbook? That's right here. It's the spine, spine and, thorax. and thorax. Right. That's what yeah. we're going on. That's what you're talking about. Right. You know what we should probably do is just put this on and we can walk our way through the DVD. Can we borrow this? I'm going to knock it out of my cup now. Does anybody know how to put it in here? It's gone. Does anybody know? Does this have a. Yes, it does. It does. It does. It does. So let's put this aside. I just put it in there. Let's see if it knows that I did that. Just put it in. I just unplug this. Yes. What? Okay, how do I get the DVD player? Let's see, here we go. Media player, is that it? Does anybody know how to watch the DVD in here? Awesome. I saw it. I had seen it. I had seen it on Facebook, but I hadn't watched it. But of course, for me, I was like, "Here we go." Okay, this will be, this is good. Yeah, basically it's just, an, uh, well, well, we'll plug it into chapter four. This is the whole book. That makes sense. In fact, she had, Sandra had suggested that. <coughs> Here we go. Here we go, spine and thorax. So this will get us done in half an hour, and then we'll talk about Reiki, and then we'll go downstairs. How's that sound? Way to go. I love the trail guy. Okay. And then next week, we'll move on to the shoulder and the arm, and we'll slow it down if we need to. Okay? Are we going to have a muscle test Monday? Muscle no way. I don't hope not. <laughs> don't give me any ideas. <laughs> What, uh, what's the last thing she handed out? I don't know. I don't know the so bendy much. thing. The bendy no, thing. there's no test on the bendy. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's I'm pull in this thing. I love how we're learning like everything, but yeah, what we're doing. Right. Right. We're all like them. All right, we'll play them all, right? I'm going to wing this thing. Oh, we'll take them one at a time. The erector spinae group 
runs from the sacrum to the occiput along the posterior aspect of the vertebral column. Okay, we're good. The erector spinae muscles are like a tall poplar tree with three main branches. In I can case, stop it. Spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis. The spinalis is the smallest of the three muscles and lies closest to the spine in the laminar group. These are your postural muscles. They keep you erect. And lateral iliocostalis form a visible mound along the lumbar and thoracic spine. The long tendons of iliocostalis extend laterally beneath the scapula. So the erector spinet. This is so good. Broad this muscles well, right up rock and roll. Rock and roll. Half an hour. In and out. I'm going to begin by asking my partner to just raise. We can see okay. Right Kill the there. lights a little now, more. If you need, I don't think you need to take notes. It's up to you. But you do need to know origin, insertion, action. And there we can see. Isn't this great? Yeah. Diane, make sure you get this back because this is yours. I borrowed yours. And notice when I ask them to relax, they soften and seem to disappear. Now, to engage the upper fibers, I'll ask my partner to just sort of arch his back a little bit. There you go. And there we can see deep to those middle fibers of the trapezius, the upper portion of the erector spinae right there. Great. Go ahead and relax. And they seem to It's a huge muscle. Well, right. no, I'm thinking trapezius. Now, there's probably this, only are... one key bony landmark or landmark <laughs> that's going to help really get your hand on the erectors. And that's going to be the spinous processes of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. They run, of course, right down the center of the spine. And I can just set my fingers on those like so. Not hard, but you can, you can certainly say it would be the find them. PSI cysts, the posterior superior iliac spines, where those dimples are often found in the low back. And then lastly, probably the surface of the sacrum right here, which is where a lot of the erectors attach onto right onto that tissue into the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. Good. So what I'm going to do is just set my fingers next to the spinous processes and see if I can work my fingers into those erectors. Now, since I know that they run up the spine, I know that the fiber direction is going to run this way. So I'm going to purposefully roll my fingers across the fibers and really get a sense of their fibers and their density, really quite large here in the lumbar area. And as I progress superiorly, they become a little broader and a little more tendinous, sort of thinning out a little bit. Here I'm working underneath those lower fibers of the trapezius. Now there's three branches of the erector spinae. The most uh, medial, closest to the spinous processes, will be the smaller branch of the three, which will be the spinalis, right in here, right in that lamina groove. And then if I take it a step further lateral, I'm going to roll across the longissimus fibers. And then the most lateral will be the iliocostalis right out here, which has those Attaching tendons that come here almost spreading right underneath the scapula. Costalis, they're attaching to the ribs. Let's just check to make sure we're on the muscles we think we're on. <coughs> <Huh>. If I <laughs> my partner to just right. raise his feet up a little bit, I want to see if these muscles engage, and they do. Great, go ahead and relax. Do these fibers run vertically up the spine? Yes, they do. And if I move up into the thoracic area here, beneath the superficial trapezius and then the intermediate rhomboid fibers, deep to those there I can feel the fibers of the erector spinae. And those are just all ways that you can check to make sure that you're really feeling the erectors down the entire back. Okay. I'm not sure. This was everything, right? He did this, palpate them, check it. Okay, we want to play them all, so. I 
think we may have to go back here. Yeah. Okay. It's going to start all over again, so I'll The Erector Spinet Group run. So the Erector. Now, there's. Okay. I think we just have to go. Nope, not yet. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Okay. Oops. Sound right here. Easily feel a series of points that are the. Did I go too far ahead, or? You can feel the thoracic spinous processes. You can even just roll my fingers around them either side. Spaces in between them. That okay? And then as we move into the lumbar area, I notice that. They're a little further apart as the vertebrae are larger. And I can follow them all the way down here to that surface of the sacrum. So we've got the spinous processes, and then we've got the transverse processes that are quite a bit more difficult to locate because they're deep. Right, but and the distance see. between the transverse processes is going to change because in the lumbar area, obviously the vertebrae are larger, so the TBPs are further lateral. That's great. I love seeing But that. as we ascend the spine, the TBPs get closer to the spinous processes as the vertebrae get smaller in size. So, let's first locate the lumbar TBPs. I'm going to just locate the spinous processes here and then slide over those large erector spinae muscles and then just kind of come in through the side door here laterally and feel <laughs> for the bony ridge that's formed by the TBPs of the lumbar right there. So I'm sort of going in that direction. And I'm in between the iliac crest and the 12th rib, and there's the TBPs right there. So I know that in that space is going to be the location of the rotatories and multipedi. So then I can follow that up, again, not working through the erectors, but just off to the side, and there we can continue to feel the TBPs as they lay next to the rib cage now, right there. Transverse so processes, lateral, that's right? That's the surface of the ribs right there. But if I tuck in just a little bit here <coughs> underneath and so going in the side door of the erectors, there's those TBPs See? of the thoracic vertebrae. And I can follow this all the way up here into that region between so he's not on the spine, he's to so the side of the spine. So what we've done there is isolate <coughs> where the lamina groove is, right. right in here. And now let's just take a moment to see those multipedi and rotatory. There they are as they sit right there in the lamina groove. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my fingers here, right in the thoracic area, and I'm just going to very slowly work my fingers through the erector fibers to get down to that level <coughs> of the multipedi and the rotatory. Now, I might not feel specific belly, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely going to feel the density of this muscle tissue as it sits in the laminar groove, right in there. And if I work a little further inferior here, deep to the erectors, I really have to work my fingers in through those deep, thick erector fibers, but there, in that laminar groove, is the density and mass of those multipedi and rotatories. And finally, I can move all the way down to the surface of the sacrum here. I can work right through the sheet, and I can feel the muscle tissue that sits right on top of that. And that's got to be the multifidi, because it's the only muscle that's found on the surface of the sacrum. Right there. The eight small suboccipitals are the deepest muscles of the upper posterior neck. To outline the suboccipital's location, find the superior nuchal line of the occiput, the transverse processes of C1, yes. and the spinous process of C2. The upper fibers of the trapezius can also be used as a marker. So when we say that the suboccipitals are the deepest muscles of the upper posterior neck, what exactly do we mean? Well, let's show you. First of all, if we look at the back of the neck, there we can see the most superficial muscle, and that's the trapezius. And then if we take that away, we can see the next layer, which is the splenius capitis. And then deep to that, we see the rather thick semispinalis capitis. And then finally, deepest of all, right there we see 
the suboccipitals. Mm -hmm. Eight little muscles tucked right in there at the base of the skull. Good. So now that we have an idea generally where they're located, let's isolate some landmarks to really find their lo exact location. First, we've got the superior nuchal line of the occiput running right along here at the base of the head. Now, my partner's bald, which is convenient for me, but even if he had a big head of hair, I can locate it because it runs right across pretty much the top, the top of the ear, of the ear right. or the middle of the ear right here. And I can set my fingers right along that space, and there are those superior nuchal lines, one on this side, one on this side. And it's, they sort of serve as the shoreline between the bones of the cranium and the muscles of the neck. And there we see a really nice example of okay. the external occipital protuberance. Okay, so that's one landmark that's going to help us. Not because the suboccipitals attach here. They actually attach about an inch and a half below. But that's a nice reference point to just start from. The second landmark is going to be the transverse processes of C1, which is located by finding the mastoid process this here, straight across. and then just slipping my <coughs> finger inferiorly and anteriorly a little bit. Mm. And using the broad oh, finger pads, I'm going to just feel for a deep bony knob right there. And right there and here on the other side, it's going to be the TVPs of C1, and that's going to be our second landmark to isolate the suboccipitals. And the last one will be the spinous process of C2. And there, I'm going to just set my finger pads here on the posterior neck. I'm probably about, oh, two, two and a half, three inches below the level of the external occipital protuberance. And right there is a subtle mound of the spinous process of C2. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to find since C1 doesn't have a spinous right, process. Right, so it's the first one. So, we've got the spinous process of C2, the TVPs of C1, and there the superior nuchal lines. And all of those will serve as references for where we can find the suboccipitals. And again, we can see them right there. Okay, now, if I wanted to get my hands on these muscles, Instead of actually working my fingers through the trapezius and these deeper muscles here, I'm going to actually just ask my partner to raise his head slightly, and there I can find that edge of the trapezius right there, and relax. And I'm going to just set my fingers right there along the edge of the trapezius and work my fingers into this tissue. Now again, I don't feel any of the specific bellies of the subocytals. No way. But as a mass, as a group, their mass and their density can definitely be felt right in there. And last but not least, I want to show you one thing that's interesting on my partner. Go ahead, just kind of tuck your chin a little bit. And here, we have a great example of what runs in between the two sides of the suboccipitals and the other muscles of the neck, and that's the ligamentum nuchae. There it is. Spanning from that external occipital protuberance down to the spinous process of C7. Look at that. Just a really great example of that band of connective tissue that sort of spans right up the back. Right, of the the neck. trapezius attaches to, remember? So with that in mind, let's now turn our partner's or spine originates and from. see what we can find in that position. So with my partner in a supine position, there's a simple little maneuver I can do to access the suboccipitals. Yeah. I'm going to just cradle the head Sorry with my that. hands and I'm going to find that superior nuchal line either side of that external occipital protuberance, that big knob on the back of the head. And then I'm going to just slowly sink my fingers inferiorly down toward the suboccipitals. And as my fingers sort of descend into the back of the neck, sort of rounding and following the round surface of the cranium, there I'm going to just penetrate through those superficial muscle bellies, the trapezius and whatnot, and my fingers are going to find themselves sort of resting on the density of those suboccipitals. Mm. That's just a little maneuver you can do to just let the weight of the head and the neck allow your fingers to sink right into these muscles. Okay. Although it would seem to be the deepest muscle of the low back, this is a big the quadratus one. lumborum is, strangely enough, the deepest muscle of the abdomen.
stretching from the posterior ilium to the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae and 12th rib, this squat muscle is simply an abdominal muscle located on the posterior surface of the thorax. So my partner's prone on the table, and I'm going to begin by isolating the three bony landmarks that really isolate the location of the quadratus lumborum. The first bony landmark is going to be the 12th rib which is located at the very bottom of the rib cage, of course. And I can find the surface of the rib cage. And after a while, my fingers sink into the flesh of the posterior abdomen. And at the very bottom, I'll go back a little bit, the very bottom of the rib cage, there is the 12th rib. And I can follow it immediately to where it catches here at the vertebrae. So first landmark is the 12th rib. Then we've got the posterior iliac crest. And there's his iliac crest, and I can follow it posteriorly to where it ends at the PSIS, that dimple of the low back. And then finally, the third bony landmark, or landmarks, will be the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. So we know the spinous processes are here, and the transverse processes are going to be a good distance further lateral. So I'm going to set my fingers beyond the erector spinae and work my fingers at an angle, and there I can feel the bony ridge of the transverse processes. It's not like individual points, it's more like a ridge. Good. So now we've got the 12th rib, the posterior iliac crest, and the transverse processes. And in that space will be the quadratus lumborum. So let's check it. I'm going to just set my fingers into that space. I'm going to start laterally. And I'm going to ask my partner to go ahead and bring this hip toward this shoulder. Fabulous. And just a very small contraction, I can feel the QL contract. And go ahead and relax. Good. And now with the tissue relaxed, I can really get my finger into this space between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis. Now, let's figure out where the erector spinae are in, in the midst of all this. Go ahead and raise your feet up slightly. Fabulous. And that action shows me where the erector spinae fibers are. Here's that lateral edge. And I know that there's the erectors and the QL will be further lateral. Go right. ahead and relax. QL quadratus lumborum right. he's talking about. So I can avoid the erectors <coughs> by getting right into this space for the quadratus lumborum. We can also access the quadratus lumborum in a sideline position. Mm -hmm. I can find that posterior iliac crest, and find the bottom of the rib cage, and I can set my thumbs right into that space between those landmarks and ask my partner to go ahead and hike your hip just a pinch. Mm -hmm. There, and there's that edge and contraction of the quadratus lumborum. The four abdominal muscles expand far beyond the stomach region. In fact, they form a muscular girdle that reaches around the sides of the thorax all the way to the thoracolumbar aponeurosis, and superiorly to the middle ribs, and inferiorly to the inguinal ligament. The revered oh, yeah, he's cute. belly is formed this is good. The yes, it's superficial helpful. bellies of the rectus abdominis. The lateral to the rectus abdominis is the external oblique. Unlike the round bellies of the rectus, the external oblique is a broad, superficial muscle best palpated at its attachment to the lower ribs. The thin internal oblique fibers are deep and perpendicular to the external oblique fibers and can be difficult to distinguish. And lastly, the transverse abdominis, the deepest muscle of the group, plays a major role in forced exhalation and cannot be specifically palpated. So let's begin with the rectus abdominis, better known as the six-pack muscle, but in all reality, it's a 10-pack. <laughs> so what I'm gonna ask my partner to do is just so we can see the muscle engaged is go ahead and do a little bit of a crunch. So he's gonna just flex his torso a little bit, and there we have a great example of the topography of that rectus abdominis here. And while he's just engaged, I'm just going to set my it's fingers kind of nice set. here mm -hmm. and really isolate those individual bellies that extend all the way from the rib cage down to that pubic crest. Great. Go ahead and relax. So let's just take this to the next step and just isolate some of the landmarks that help really shape where the rectus abdominis is. 
The first I'm going to find is just that edge of the ribs right here. So above that is going to be this surface of the rib cage, surface of ribs five, six, and seven. There's his xiphoid process just at the bottom of the sternum. Those are both insertions, so end, five, six, and seven in the xiphoid process. The bottom portion of the rib cage. <clears throat> and down here we've got the pubic crest. Which is now, where it originates. Just stop here for a second. Chances right. are you've never palpated your He's own. He's not talking about crest, origin and insertion, but so these are things we should you, know. You, me, and my partner. So first thing we're going to do is just go ahead and locate your navel or your umbilicus right here. And then just progressively work your fingers down inferiorly and you'll feel flesh and flesh of the belly. And then there, about six or eight inches down, just above the pubic hairline, you'll feel a ridge of bone. And that's your pubic crest. Okay? So now I'm going to try to find it on my partner. Can I locate your pubic crest? Okay. So <laughs> you got to ask, right? So there <laughs> Don't want to see it. There we just sort of may I into please? the fibers of the rectus. Mother, may I? And right about there, there's the ridge of his pubic crest. If you do a little crunch again, Dude. great. And there I can really feel the tendon of the rectus abdominis attached right there. Good. Go ahead and relax. And it gives you an idea of how the rectus abdominis sort of tapers as it comes down the abdomen like so. So now that the belly's relaxed, I'm just going to sort of work my fingers into this belly here. And you can even take both sides and gently grasp them and sort of lift them up a little bit. Great. And here yeah, you can do is it. that it's lateral it's edge it's of doable. the rectus, which is where I can feel the rectus abdominis. And on the other side is the external oblique. So, speaking of which, let's see if we can find that. So the external oblique is that broad sheet of muscle here on the side of the torso. And we sometimes think that it's like just here. But no, if you really look at it for a moment, and then... Hold on one sec. So what does the rectus abdominis do? What's the action? Flexion. Right, flexion of the trunk, right? Not extension, right? You gotta have muscles back here for extension. Okay. Just checking. There we can see it. You got an understanding. It stands all the way from this edge of the rectus around the side of the torso and all the way back here to the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. And of course, deep to the external oblique is the internal oblique. There we can see that running in perpendicular direction to the externals. And then of course, deep to those two are the transverse abdominus fibers. So we've got three broad sheets of muscle that really coat and cover this entire side of the abdomen. So if I want to see the external oblique contract, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask my partner to just bring this shoulder toward this hip. Great, because so he right, he's rotating, rotating to the opposite side. His client, right here, which are the external well, obliques, and all of this surface here, you can see where he's he getting digitates with the serrated anterior right there. <laughs> All of those fibers you can for the, really see all the, for the purposes the of this educational here video, at the edge of the it's his partner. Good and relax. Deep to that, we have the internal obliques running again perpendicularly. And so, to engage this side of the internal obliques, I'm going to have him bring this shoulder toward this hip. And so, all of these fibers shorten and deep to the external obliques, which still contract a little bit for this motion, but deep to those right in here we can feel those internal oblique fibers right there. Great. Now the, the externals, the, the externals, they both laterally flex, right? The externals will, will rotate the trunk to the opposite side, right? The internals are going to be rotating, I believe, to the same side. But they both, right, rotation of the trunk. <coughs> So one is uh, same side, one is the other side. And then side. finally, of course, we've got the transverse abdominus deep to those, which is pretty much unpalpable. No but way. If you're grasping some of this tissue on the side of the thorax right here, in between the bottom of the ribs and the iliac crest, you know that you're accessing the transverse abdominus as well. Good. Good. Okay. Great Reality model. check. Chances are that your partner is not going to have ripped abs like Or your previous. client. Right. Most people don't. <laughs> I certainly don't. And the question arises, 
When the abdomen doesn't give you any visual clues, because it's covered with a layer of adipose tissue, how do you locate the abdominal muscles? Well, I'll give you a hint. A little help from your bony landmarks. So let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. The bony landmarks that really get me in line with the rectus abdominis. Do you remember what they were? That's right. First, I'm going to just find that bottom edge of the rib cage right here. That's not where the rectus attaches, but it's a really good place to start. And I can follow it right up to the xiphoid process. process. Right. And if I walk laterally a little bit, there's that surface of those fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs right there. Good. So the muscle comes down the front of the abdomen here somewhere and attaches at that pubic crest. So can I palpate your pubic crest? Yes. Great. So there's his navel, and I'm just going to work through some of this tissue here, all the way down, and there is that pubic crest. Great. Now, if you go ahead and do a little crunch, great. And just hold it there for a second. Now, we can't see any of those. He does ribs. not have a six pack. Abdominus, but if I set my fingers right on the tissue and work through some of the adipose, there I can definitely feel some of those bellies of the rectus. And here, if I come over to the side, I can really sense the edge of that muscle. Good, go ahead and relax. Good, so even though I couldn't see any of the rectus abdominis like I saw before, I know just by using bony landmarks and a sense of where that muscle is and visualizing it, that's where my rectus is going to be. And then if I come over here to the side, I again can find that bottom edge of the rib cage knowing that those obliques are going to cover this portion of the ribs here, all of the space between the ribs and that iliac crest. Let me see if I can find that. There's that iliac crest coming around the side of the torso here. And then if I ask my partner, go ahead and try to bring this shoulder toward this hip. Great. And all of this tissue, yes, deep to the adipose tissue is definitely engaged. A very nice solid wall of muscle. Good. And relax. And then when he relaxes, I can work my fingers in and deep to this adipose and feel those obliques. So the lesson here is that you don't need to have rib abs in order to locate the abdominals. You can do it even through adipose tissue and clothing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Well, you go, you'll feel the pubic no, crest. Like on, the, on the ribs, it looks like there's some little muscles on the, on the bottom, on the front. Well, they're attaching. Yeah. Okay, we've got so many more muscles to cover, but this gives us at least a start on the <clears throat> uh, spine and thorax. Let's see. <sighs> this is what we need shoulder and arm, but that would take another 50 minutes. All that's on there? Yes. Yeah, all that's, huh? Yeah, it's a great, you should take advantage of it and watch it at home. You've got the trail guide. It comes with a DVD, right? Sure, why not? Make sure to bring it back, please. Make sure there's a DVD in it. Um, Yeah, I love to do the, the shoulder and the arm. Let's get started on this at least. Maybe we can get the sits muscles. Come on. Go. Uh, <coughs> rotator cuff muscles. Let's cover that at the very least, okay? Because we all hear about those. You hear about them all the time. So... <clears throat> Let's cover that 9 minutes and 21 seconds, and then we'll talk about uh, Reiki. And we'll go downstairs. Okay. Can we just play all? Oh, right, right, play all. Okay, but I don't want it to start. Well, then I'll just. Oh, wait. If you click like that, we didn't finish the path. I'm going to, yeah, click on that.
continues. Yeah, we'll find out. All right. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres, minor, and subscapularis. These are four are known as the rotator cuff muscles. Together, I think they're they out and about, and therefore stabilize the glenohumeral joint. All of the rotator cuff muscles are very accessible. The chunky supraspinatus is located in the supraspinous fossa, deep to the trapezius's upper fibers. Right, its belly see runs it's running. underneath the acromion and attaches to the humerus's greater tubercle. Looks familiar, right? Four muscles that stabilize the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. Big job, very important. Let's get a handle on them. I'm going to begin with the supraspinatus. There you can see that small rotator cuff muscle that sits right off the top of the shoulder. And probably the easiest way to get a handle on it is to find that spine of the scapula here that runs at an angle up toward the acromion. And if I let my finger slide superior into the supraspinous fossa, there I can feel, deep to those fibers of the trapezius, the supraspinatus belly right there. So it's originating on the supraspinous fossa of the scapula, right? And it's an inserting on the greater tubercle, right, of the humerus, right? Okay, so what's it doing? What's it? Abduction. Right, it's assisting the deltoid in abduction, okay? And it's part of the, it's, yeah, it's a scapula. And as I follow it laterally, Sorry. it gets a little thinner and a little more tendinous. And there it passes underneath the acromion to attach to that greater tubercle of the humor fascia. here, deep to the Both. deltoid. F A S C I A. So if I want fascia. to feel the supraspinatus and just ask my partner to just try to adjust your shoulder a little bit, press the muscle belly is the middle, and there, heavy. deep again, it's not as, yeah, it's usually fibers. the thickest, that heaviest, muscle, fattest part of the small little guy. Definitely the muscle belly and relax. And there it definitely softens up. Now, finally, to soften where you lengthen the supraspinatus, <clears throat> I can come over to the side and I can shorten the supraspinatus by abducting the shoulder and I can lengthen it by bringing the arm back right. to the side of the body. Contracting adducting when you're abducted. The flat convergent belly of the infraspinatus is located in the infraspinous fossa. Most of its belly is superficial with the medial portion deep to the trapezius and a lateral portion beneath the deltoid. The teres minor is a small muscle squeezed between the infraspinatus and teres major. It is located high in the axilla and can be challenging to grasp. So now let's isolate the second and third rotator cuff muscles, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. So let's begin with the infraspinatus. The easiest way to find its belly is to isolate the three bony landmarks that surround it. That would include the spine of the scapula here, the medial border of the scapula here, there's the inferior angle, and then the lateral border of the scapula here. And if I set my fingers along these three landmarks, it's going to form a bit of a triangle. And that's where that infraspinatus belly is going to be before all the convergent fibers come this way to pass underneath the deltoid and attach at that greater tubercle of the humerus. So if I want to see it engage, I'm going to ask my partner to just simply raise his elbow up just a little bit off the table. Ooh, great. And there we can see a nice example of the infraspinatus right there, right in between those landmarks. Here we can see a bit of the teres major. Here's some of that posterior deltoid. And there we can see some of the fibers of the trapezius. Good body. Go ahead and relax. Nicely defined. I'm just going to set my fingers right in that triangle and roll across the fibers of the infraspinatus. It has a very different feel than the supraspinatus we were feeling before, which was a little more bulky and more malleable. Good, and I can follow this laterally, again, as it passes underneath the deltoid and becomes more tendinous right there. So there's our infraspinatus. Next to it is going to be the teres, teres minor. minor again. There you go. 
And for the teres minor, I'm going to just locate the lateral border of the scapula again. Just mark that out. And right along this pathway is going to be two teres muscles. The teres major, and then just above it, the teres minor. Now the teres major is going to be much larger as its name insinuates. And I can just get my fingers on that here, on my partner. And then I'm going to leave my fingers just above it and roll across the small teres minor. So the teres minor sits between the teres major and the infraspinatus. And if I ask my partner to just laterally rotate the shoulder joint, just go ahead and press your hand, the back of your hand in mind. Great. There we can see the infraspinatus again contracts. And right next to it is the small teres minor. Now what's curious is, notice that the teres major, it's not doing anything because it does not laterally rotate the humerus. But if I ask him to go the other way, go ahead and just medially rotate, wow, look who shows up. The teres major now <laughs> definitely engages, but the infraspinatus and teres minor are relaxed. Good. So they're antagonists on rotation of the shoulder. So if we wanted to shorten the teres minor and infraspinatus, we can add up the shoulder, and to lengthen them, we can abduct the shoulder like so. Yeah, nice. So lengthened and shortened. Good. So now for our fourth rotator cuff muscle, I'm going to turn my partner sideline to locate the subscapularis. The deep subscapularis located on the scapula's anterior surface is sandwiched between the subscapular fossa and serratus anterior muscle, with only a small portion of its muscle belly accessible. So here's what we're going to do. First, I'm just going to scoop up my partner's arm and just pull it forward, which brings the scapula off the rib cage like so, opening up the axilla or armpit. And what this affords is, now I can sink my thumb into the axilla and access part of that anterior surface of the scapula. But in order to do that, I need to just avoid some of this tissue here, and that's the latissimus dorsi and the teres major. So instead of trying to sink my thumb through this tissue, I'm going to just put my thumb right here in front of it, and then very slowly, with my no, it's breath, good. You get in there and you work. Sink my thumb slowly you into the packs. axilla until I find myself bumping into the anterior surface of that scapula, right about there. And if I just want to check if I'm on the muscle, I'm going to ask my partner to try to immediately rotate his shoulder. So I'm going to ask him to try to swing his hand this way. Great. And relax. And do that about, oh, 20%. Great. Just a nice small contraction in there. Underneath my thumb, I feel the subscapularis engage. Good. And relax. And also, while I'm here, I can explore moving the shoulder to get in even a little bit further. I'm going to slowly bring my thumb out, and there we go. And now let's try to find this from a supine position. I can do pretty much the same thing. I'm going to just bring the arm up, hold it like so. I'm going to notice that all of this tissue here is the latissimus dorsi, part of that teres major, and I'm going to set my thumb right into that space. And then mobilizing the shoulder, I'm going to slowly sink my thumb into the axilla, just sort of following my partner's breath, because this is someone's armpit. It's still a little tender. And right there, I feel sort of a wall that is no, the no, anterior no. surface of the scapula. And if I ask my partner to try to immediately rotate his shoulder like that, great. Underneath my thumb, there's a very solid contraction. Good and relaxed. And it's not really like a big tubular muscle or anything. It's more of like just a flat wall of muscle running against the scapula. Good. And that is another way you can access some of that subscapularis in a supine position. And finally, if we want to lengthen the subscapularis, I can laterally rotate the shoulder. And to shorten it, I can medially rotate the shoulder. So lengthen and shorten. And there's some information to get you started to locating and palpating the four muscles that stabilize the glenohumeral joint, the rotator cuff muscles. Right.
holds the shoulder. Holds the humerus into the glenoid fossa. Okay, we've got to move. We don't have to, but we want to move on to <coughs> Reiki, right? Sorry? Nothing. What, what, what? Reiki. What did you want? No, no, I, I was just... I, I, I well, just got Reiki. Yeah. Okay. She wanted to do Reiki and some muscles... Uh, okay, how can I, how can I eject this? You can, I'll listen, what do you have to say? How do we reject this? Eject, there we go. Okay, here you go, Diane. All right, we can turn the lights on. Close this. Oh yeah, Wait, did I? Where's that? Vocational programs, right? I guess. More like vocational programs. I don't know. I've never seen that. I didn't find any with a CD in it. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, we're done with it. Done with this. <coughs> you with this CV? Sorry? So you give this CV? I got it out. It's not mine, it's hers. I borrowed it. There should be one here, but. None of them have a. Yeah. Sorry. No. Okay, you've got a Reiki handout. You have a Coach's Reiki handout, right? Now that, that talks about attunement. Right, that. <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't punch holes in it, so if you need them, do it yourself for now. What is, what is Reiki? Huh? What does Reiki mean? R-E-I-K-I. Right? I K I. It's pronounced Ray T. Okay. Um, so, what does it mean? Universal energy. Universal life force. Right? Which is another way, I guess, of saying energy. What is it like to be the energy? Maybe. Uh, the. Again, it, it comes from China, and it comes from Japan, actually, and before that it came from Tibet. Um, Chinese, it's Leiki, L-E-I-K-I, but they're characters, they're Japanese characters, Chinese characters. They look like, um, anyway, universal life force energy is what it stands for, and what is it? I mean, what's, what's all the word about Reiki? Why is everybody so excited about Reiki? Healing. Healing, okay. What, is it, what do we do with Reiki? What does it feel like? Does anybody, has anybody experienced Reiki? Well, you probably haven't, haven't you? No, you have, but no, not, nobody's... You have, okay. Hmm? You can be, you don't have to be. Okay. I don't do it. Sorry? I don't do it. You, what do you mean you don't? Touching, touching. Oh, when you do Reiki. You're a Reiki master? Right, okay. Yeah, most people, when you do Reiki, we do not have to touch. We stay a few inches. We could stay even more than that far away. When I first did my Reiki training attunement, we were initially going to see how far they you could feel the energy. They use something like a divining rod. And what? Huh? Ooh, you really? Oh, we'll have to maybe try it. So, anyway. <coughs> but you can. 
we are, we're, everything is energy when you get down to it. I mean, every, everything is energy. It's just a question of how fast it's vibrating, right? It's vibrating really fast. It's not solid. Right? Slower, slower the vibration, the more solid it would be. But everything is, one way or another, is broken down to energy. Um, we may not realize it, but we extend far beyond our physical bodies, right? So you've got an energetic field, like a, um, a force. It's an electrical, uh, electrical ma electromagnetic field, force, that extends, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from 9 to even 15 feet can extend that far beyond the body. If you're healthy and it's whole, your aura, your energy field s extends farther. So when I'm interacting, when I'm walking, we're walking around, our energy fields are bumping. And if you're in a bad mood, I'm probably, I may not, whether I see it or not, you know, I'll probably, you walk into a room, right, and somebody's in a, you know, just had a fight or an argument or just not in a good mood, you feel it, right? Nobody has to say any, am I right? You've all experienced that. So in that sense, you've experienced the energy. Okay. Now, some people, when they receive Reiki, some people feel it as warmth right, uh, or heat. Some people feel tingling, um, electrical sense. You ever feel a sense energy, well, I think of it, some, some people feel nothing at all, but that doesn't mean they're not receiving the Reiki, okay? And again, Reiki, what do, what do <coughs> they may not feel it, but they're receiving it. Um, generally, when we do Reiki work, we're doing it on a massage table, right? We're doing Reiki. Um, we can, you can do it sitting down, I mean, with the with the client sitting down. Um, when I first started seriously studying Reiki to, to get a credential, right? What does Reiki give you? It gives you, people, it's a term that people know. There's lots of ways to do energy work. It's not, it's not all Reiki, but it's all energy work. So you could say it is all Reiki. Reiki is life, universal life force. What do we do to, to give Reiki? Anybody? have any sense other than you? You get out of the way. You get your ego out of the way, right? So, right? Whoops. You, be, you have to become like an extension cord. You become an extension cord. You become a channel. A channel. Literally, yeah. you become a channel and you receive, you, you your ego is not involved. It's not about me. Hey, wow, I'm a cool one. Reiki master, please. You know? Reiki masters are a dime a dozen. Well, maybe not a dime a dozen, but, you know, 15, 20 cents a dozen. Um, they're out there. There are lots of them. And, and it's, it's a known type of energy work. So it's worth people pay attention when you say, I, I'm a Reiki practitioner or I'm a, or I'm a Reiki master. Um, you can receive Reiki in a circle. Often it's done in a group, right? So you'll go into, um, when I first started studying, I worked, studied at a place in um, uh, Hollywood, I guess it is. Just Sheridan, just off of you. Yeah, Sheridan US 1. Earth, Earth, I think it's Earth Apothecary. Is that what it's called? I think it's Earth Apothecary. Yep, that's what it's called. That's where I did my first two levels of training. Um, they have a, an inner sanctuary where people sit in a large circle to receive Reiki, and they're all facing the center. And then the Reiki practitioners gather around the walls, and some energetic work is done to, to ground and to, to get the, the energy working together, depending on how many people are working. The people doing the Reiki will come up behind you and work on you for a period of time. What back. Is what is it supposed to do? Moving the energy. It's, move, it's healing. It's healing work. It's moving energy. So it's using energy to quote unquote heal. Right? 
If it belief goes a long way, absolutely. If then they're probably not going to sign up for it. But yes, it definitely takes a certain level of. Um, you've got to buy into it. If you're if you're not receptive to it, then you won't receive it. You'll, it's a waste of, probably a waste of time on the part of the practitioner. Isn't going through? Yeah, it's going, but they're whether or not, you, to a certain extent, you're right. But if they're, re if they're not receptive, then why, going? why bother? Exactly. The energy will say, I can do better work next yeah. to the next person. Right? Um, Yeah, there's a my, section. Yeah, go ahead. My sister don't believe in it. She's Christian, so she, she thinks that all this is kind of... Spooky uh, stuff, right. Or like, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But she's asking me to give him a massage. Right. So I, I do the massage and I give right I don't... I have to... You don't have to tell her that you're doing it. Right. Well, most, most people that I do energy work on or with, <coughs> excuse me, um, I do it with their knowledge. If they're not interested in the energy work, then I'm going to work strictly body work, massage, and we get the results that they're looking for. Uh, my practice, I do a lot of energy work, and that's something that I, I've always been drawn to, and therefore seem to, it works, brings people to my practice. It's alternative, there's no question about it. It's not really mainstream, but it's something that we can do. And without a doubt, it's, it, is, it can be remarkably effective. You can give it to your plants and to your animals. Yeah. Right? All living things. Don't tell anybody, but you can do it. No, okay. mm. <laughs> you know, the... the, the <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right, you can just do the Reiki, right? And for the most part, we're doing the Reiki, we don't have to touch. Right? We can, and you can do energy work when you're, t when you're touching the body, just as when you're not, but as, um, it's nice if you don't have to touch it. I mean, the energy is flowing. I know when I'm doing it, I feel the energy. <laughs> And it's, it's coursing through me. I just, I get out of the way. Before I do my, my uh, before I have my sessions that will include body, go beyond the body work, when I have, uh, do the quote unquote Reiki, some people call it Reiki, I call it energy work. Um, before I do that, I go into my healing room and I do some for lack of a better word, I do some prayers. I prepare the room energetically. Um, I get out of the way. I ask for help to become, essentially I ask to become a pure conduit of healing energy. Okay? And I humbly say, it is not about me. It doesn't belong to me. It's not my energy. It's the universal energy. It belongs to all of us. And in a sense, it, it's... It takes you to the level of we're all one, you know? One in the many, many in the one. Yes? So if I'm a, like, a customer and I come to your spa and I say I want to raise you to treat okay. a session, mm -hmm. I'm, what, what am I? Like, am I angry and just want my energy to be relaxed? Or like, what does the person usually go in for to get the treatment? Right. Mm, uh, good question. First of all, the treatment will probably last about 50 minutes to an hour. Okay. okay. The person will be lying on a table, um, generally in a supine position because they're most comfortable, right? You would agree? Um, like if you're vacuuming. What's that? I just look at it like it's a cleanup, like you're going to vacuum your floor, you know, like you're getting rid of some debris and crap. Mm -hmm. Well, you are. You're, you're, you're combing through the, ener the person's energy field. Uh, what I, when, I don't want to keep referring to my practice, but it's what I know best. If you get tired of hearing me say what I, this I tell me, and I'll stop. But um, we bring, I bring to the classroom what I do. And since I do a lot of energy work, 
Um, let me back up and say there are symbols, right? We could talk about there are Reiki symbols. The, the, the Reiki tradition goes back probably millennia to Tibet, although it really was kind of, we would say, rediscovered by uh, Dr. Usui at the top of a mountain on a 21-day retreat. And he sat there meditating for 21 days. This is a Japanese character about 120, 30, 40 some odd years ago, late 1800s, I believe. Um, and nothing happened for 20 days. And then on the 21st day, he got zapped with all this energy, so to speak. He could see colors. And he realized something profound had happened. And he went home and sorted it out. And he came up with, with a series of, of symbols um, that he was instructed to, to use. So you can, and he realized that the, the, the symbols came from, we'll see you Monday. Okay, then we'll be back up here, I would assume, and Coach will be here too. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Um, where was I? So they, they, they sorry, yeah, they, you, you visualize, or you can visualize the symbols. Some people will draw the symbol in the air while they're visualizing, and they do it a number of times. When I work at this point, do you do that when you, when you do the, your Reiki? Do you? Call on the symbols. Sorry? Uh -huh. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, but what we're doing in any case is we're combing through their energy field. Would you agree? Yeah, so Fernando is, is a Reiki master, which means you've gone through at least three levels of training and what they call attunements, where someone will put their hands on or above you or on you and... and through the teacher, through the Reiki master, who's the one who theoretically is the only one who can give you an attunement, um, you'll receive after studying in a class over the course of a couple of days or maybe more, <coughs> you receive uh, the symbols, you receive this, this energy, and then you can practice at that first level, and then you go on to the next level, which is even higher, and then you spend a good solid weekend or whatever, at some point down the road, you don't do this three weekends in a row to get first, second, and master level. You don't become a quote-unquote master overnight. Um, but in any case, after three levels of the Isui uh, training, you can become a Reiki master. There are other types of, there's Shambhala, there's other more recent types of, of Reiki. But essentially, as I see it, they're all working with universal life force energy. Generally 50 minutes to an hour. But what I usually do is incorporate energy work into my full body work. Mm -hmm. now I end with, well, I'm always work almost though, without even thinking about it. We're working with energy. When you're working on someone and you're focusing, I mean, when I, all I have to do is start talking about energy, and my fingers start yeah, to I throb. I think you can intentionally say, uh, I'm going to give you a just massage. I'm not going to give you energy. Right. It's impossible because you're giving, it's, it's, you're mixing your energy with them. You're, you are, now you don't want to pick, you learn not to pick up things from them. The energy doesn't necessarily, I don't need whatever stuff is happening that may be messing you up or, you know, causing you, if you've come in having, having had a fight with your partner, and I don't mean the one on your table, <laughs> yeah. you're carrying that into, into the space. So one of the things that I do before I begin any session is I ground myself and I kind of surround myself with a Reiki bubble, right, a protection. Because when we're working, we're dealing with energy, and if, if we don't protect ourselves, we'll pick stuff up, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course it is. Yeah, and then you oh, what did it what put me in a bad mood. So like draining. Yeah. I mean, I went through a stressful... I've, we've all gone through stressful times, and I... Where's it going to happen? The stress is going to hit your body, or you're going to... Sometimes I'll be working on someone who has a certain a sciatic issue, and I wasn't really thinking about it, I wasn't focused on protecting myself, and then my sciatic is hurting the next day, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Got to be careful. Ground, ground yourself when I go in. Again, I, cause since when I know I'm going to be doing some pretty serious Reiki, quote-unquote, energy work on someone, I really prepare the room, and um, 
It's, it's powerful stuff. <clears throat> what if I'm your client and mm -hmm. you perform it on me, but I'm not, I'm not one of those clients who like seriously believe in it. Does it affect me in any way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it depends. Yes, it can. But if you're not seriously believing in it, why are you coming to see me about it anyway? Yeah, yeah. Or they just, they're curious. You know, they hear about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, usually what happens by the time I'm done is they say, wow. <laughs> right? Am I right? Now, part of what, again, I generally don't do 50-minute Reiki sessions. You can. You could do Reiki with, with two or three or four people working on one body, which is what you do when you're training, right? Um, they're saying, oh, I was just looking at Reiki here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Sure, sure. Bring it all in. There's no... They, um, they're saying it's 90 minutes. You could, yeah. I don't think it's necessary, but it depends, you know. I do Reiki circles. Uh, in the yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we spend, like, we are still working on the people. And we do it, like, three, 15 minutes. About 15 minutes for each person. Yeah, generally, in, when you're in a Reiki circle and you've got a group of practitioners, you don't have 90 minutes to spend. They're paying, well, they're not paying you for an hour. They're paying you to be in a Reiki group, a group circle. So they're, I don't think they're expecting more than five or ten. But you could get, if, depending on how many practitioners there are, maybe each person in the circle could receive two or three times from two or three different people. Yeah, yeah. But if, you're, if, if I'm doing a, a, a uh, Reiki session f for 50 minutes to an hour, you know, then... You want to feel the wow. Who said that? Me. Mm -hmm. Are we going to go downstairs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, what's happening in here? This talks about Reiki attunement, the attunement procedure. I'm not, we're not, I'm not, a, we're not attuning you. Um, <clears throat> but it does give you, let's see. It, it, let's see, on page three of the five, it talks about breathing through your hands. So you're visualizing, I, I don't even, I'm not sure what gasho, do you know what gasho is? Oh, the, the position. Right, right, right. Okay. So, let me see. So you're, you're, you're preparing to give the Reiki. Well, I think one of the first things you need to know or you need to do in order to experience it is just to clear your head and see if you can visualize Reiki energy. That sometimes it brings up things from the past or memories and all kinds of stuff in the person who's receiving the Reiki. It can, it can. I don't know, some people will come to Reiki looking for or having done or wanting to do, being curious about past life, past life, um, past life regression. regression, or is that what they call it? Yes, I've done a number of them. I don't, I mean, I don't. Not on yourself, but you give to other people. I've no. done some heavy duty stuff like that, but I generally don't do it now. I've been to a number of, of past life regression cir uh, groups, small groups. Um, it's interesting. Um, I've actually been to a, once, a future life procession. So it's kind of, kind of curious to imagine myself. And it's, it's to a certain extent, past life work is, it's, it's hypnosis, you know? It's, it's taking you into an altered state of consciousness without Ideally, without drugs, some people use drugs, you know, to assist, and there are cultures that do that. Uh, yeah, I don't recommend it. I'm not, I haven't taken it, I'm not about to do it. Um, not today, anyway. <clears throat> um, you need a trained shaman to, to work with something like that. I've worked with shamans, I've thought about doing some shamanic training, but it hasn't, hasn't. No. No, no. I've had, you know, as past life work can be tricky enough as it is because you could stumble into a life that you weren't too happy about. You know, things happen. Because you're at, if we could talk about this till the cows come home, because you, you take steps back and you're, you walk, 
literally into, ideally you go over a bridge and you count your way, or you've got a facilitator counting you through this, guiding you through, and then you say, okay, where are you? What are you wearing? And that sort of thing, and, and you move on. You have to see yourself die and stuff like that. It's uh, not the funnest thing in the world, but, but, it, but it can be wonderful, but I don't, but anyway. Yes, go ahead. Um, oh, yes, because no, no, no. I want to get... Is a uh -huh. And like, um, this other girl that I work with had some, I don't know what the issue was, a condition, illness, whatever. So she is going to take this medication. Mm -hmm. So Stephanie is the regular expert. So she, the patient gave a bottle of pills to Stephanie to, she like held them. Uh -huh, to, to infuse them with energy? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that all? It can be done. No, I know people who work. Crystals. Yeah, crystals, because crystals carry piezoelectricity. That's, I work with crystals. It's getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> but I'm sure that, that, that coach has done, I don't know if she does it on a regular basis, but if you do this enough, you take enough Reiki classes and, you, and you're open to the different possibilities, because the crystals can help intensify the, the work, whether it's chakra work, or, or other energy work. Okay. Um, These no. are illustrations to self-practice? Yeah, one of them, the first one is self-practice, yeah. okay. And the second one is giving to the, is giving to someone on the table. Now they've got them uh, supine as well as prone, depending on how much time you have. Um, no, I, I don't know. If, yeah, I guess it, here it's, it's prone. But I thought without too much training, we can, we can go downstairs, get people on a table, and visualize the energy coming into you, right? And see if you can feel it, right? Feel, I mean, we've all done, you've all, I have you? I don't know. Put your hands together to see what you can feel between the hands. So no, did any chakras, chakra work, yeah, you've done chakra work, which is what she also had on the agenda tonight, if we have time. She said, you guys know that, and I know you know that. I do chakra I work. I don't, I'd like to go over that, too. Yeah, yeah I don't. Right. I don't, I don't we did that okay, well, somebody, because I've yeah, seen them do, all right, I'll I see, like we'll have to really dig up her like, chakra work, because it's different from like, mine. I feel like I the one she showed us was very, like, overstructured, I get it, like, you're following the, the chakras, but I feel like it's one of those things where you have to be creative, and it has to come from within, and it's different. There are lots of ways to do things. Yeah. You know, there's so different ways to do chakra wrong. work. There's no there is no. Is they all, if your intention is good, there shouldn't be a wrong way yeah, to do this, it. right? I don't remember that. If you can show us maybe another way of how you would do it. Yeah, I do. I do chakra work, basically just working the the seven basic chakras, and I chakras are filters, right? I like got an AC filter. What do you have to do with your AC filter or your car filter every so often? You gotta clean it out, right? So that's when I do chakra work. That's why I love um, right in the meridian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where well, we're talking about meridians, that's where the energy is flowing. Now, when we're working Reiki, we're not working on the meridians, but we can we can feel ideally what what's going on, and you'll you may sense heat or cold or sometimes a spike, right? Or you just sense when you've done it. Practice, 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 which is like, I know you're tired of hearing, how do I get it? By practicing. But as with anything else, if you practice, you get better at it. It's, it's palpation without touching, right? You feel the heat. You feel, you should be able to just, I mean, kill the lights and just, you can see the energy if you, the, the key, not that you have to be seeing it, but often the key to this is your eyes are, kind of a little unfocused, am I right? You, you're looking, you don't, have, you don't need, you don't want to be fully focused. And you do that and you can start to sense the energy, just kind of let your eyes relax. And you start to feel the energy in your body. Have you, any of you done any of this work at all? No? 
we've got to do guided meditation then. We don't, I'm not going to do it tonight, but... Um, yeah, she said you need to learn how to meditate and clear your mind. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of whether you use music, you lower the lights, turn off the TV. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to arrange for, I mean, it, it will cost a few shekels, maybe 10 or 15 bucks a head. Is that, that's doable for, okay. I don't know, I'll work out a deal. I'm not sure where yet, but somewhere in the, in the Carl Springs area, you know, somewhere. I mean, at the school? Yeah. Well, that's, I don't know what the teachers are like. I, you know, that's a possibility. I know Central Campus, I took it Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll find something. I've, I know lots of people. All right, let's, let's turn this off. Let's go downstairs, right? Low lights. We'll turn on some music. Yeah, we'll get a sense of how we can feel our own energy. Yeah, because we can't do something if we don't feel it. Right. We're not going to be able to do it. Right. So that's maybe the first thing to do is just to work alone and then in pairs to see... What do you feel? Yeah, you feel the energy from the other yeah. person's hand. We need to start, maybe, it seems like we need to start there. Then we can get on the table, maybe tonight, maybe not till we next week, and actually practice some Reiki. Read up on Reiki as much as you can. Look at some videos. You've got something that from the library, Robert. Absolutely.